Uh, hello and welcome back to another relativity class. Today we're going to do lots of cool stuff. We're going to do billiard, billiards a relativistic way. We're going to introduce a very important concept, the centre of momentum frame. The idea of threshold energies. Uh, how much energy do you need to create new particles in a particle accelerator? We'll uh, I'll study some photons from a relativistic perspective, specifically we'll write down the form momentum, the energy momentum tensor equivalently for photons, uh, and study the Comptonist effect from a perspective of relativity. We'll also tensorialize the idea of force. So let's go with section 26 on relativistic billiards. Now billiards is when you have some ball, let's say A, which is moving relative to the table, striking a stationary ball B. Relativistic billiards is when the velocity of the um, so-called bullet, A is called the bullet, B is called the target. Uh, this is language of, um, of particle physics of collision theory, the bullet and the target. Relativistic billiards is when the bullet has a speed that is a, a non-negligible fraction of the speed of light. Now we don't do relativistic billiards with billiard balls, we do it with high energy particles, electrons, protons, anti-electrons, um, nuclei and so on. Uh, I'll be mentioning examples for electron-electron and more, more pertinently proton-proton collisions. So let's study relativistic billiards and I, I want to draw a, a diagram around this. Uh, we're going to have two frames of reference. Now we have been calling those frames S and S prime. I'm now going to call S, um, I could call it S, I could call, also call it the art laboratory frame. This is the frame in which the laboratory exists. It's an approximately inertial frame, and in that laboratory frame, the um, pre-collision target particle is stationary, and the pre-collision bullet particle is moving, and that pre-collision bullet particle is moving uh, with some speed um, velocity v, which we'll choose to be in the x direction of our s frame approximate inertial frame. So target uh, stationary relative to the laboratory frame, the S frame, bullet moving uh, with a velocity of V in the X direction, in, um, um, in, in the X direction. This is a pre-collision scenario. After the collision, um, yeah, after the collision, the target will recoil uh, with some recoil velocity and it will make some angle theta with respect to the positive x-axis. Um, the bullet, on the other hand, in general, will be deflected through some angle, which I'll call phi. Uh, and here I'll have both theta and phi being positive. So one theta is positive in the, measured in the anti-clockwise, phi is positive measured in the clockwise sense. Now, this is the collision scenario. Uh, according to the laboratory frame. Now a classic thing in relativity, no frame is privileged, but having said that, some frames are better than others in the sense of some frames, some inertial frames, allow you to calculate what you need to calculate more easily. Uh, and this is going to be an important example of this. Uh, instead of having the so-called lab frame, we can ask what frame could I boost to? Uh, what frame S prime could I boost to? No frame is privileged, but I want a frame that makes my problem easier to work through. So I want a new frame S prime, which is going to make my problem easier. Now the way to make this problem easier calculationally is if we choose the right boost velocity. And by the way, I'm calling this a capital V. Uh, this uh, initial velocity of the particle is called capital V here, and it's a scalar and it's positive and it's in the positive x direction. If I boost um, in this direction, this thing's going to slow down, and this thing's actually going to be travelling uh, to the left. There's no absolute frame of rest. I want to boost, um, I'm going to choose my boost velocity to be such that um, in this new frame, these particles actually approach one another with equal and opposite velocity. So the pre-collision scenario, again, we're boosting in this direction, um, reducing the speed in this direction of this object, the bullet, and also making the target um, move to the left no privileged frame of reference, um, and we're going to choose our frame. Let these particles have the same rest mass. We're going to choose our uh, initial frame, S sorry, our, um, I'm calling it the centre of momentum frame, for reasons I'll explain in a, sec in a second. So centre of momentum frame, 
And by definition, this is going to be the frame in which, before the collision, two particles have equal and opposite uh, velocities. And so this is going to be coming in with a, with a um, vector of magnitude v, speed v, uh, equal and opposite velocities yep, in the primed frame. And we're doing this, um, or we call it the centre of momentum frame because it's going to be a frame in which the total momentum uh, of the system vanishes. So we want to conserve energy and momentum. This is the pre-collision scenario. The post-collision scenario, initially in the lab frame, was quite complicated with two recoil angles. Well, if momentum's conserved, then after the collision, after the collision, before the collision, we've got zero momentum. After the collision, we've got zero momentum. This tells us that the recoil momenta of the, um, um, of the two particles after the collision um, must be collinear. In fact, they must be pointing in the opposite directions. And since they're the same rest masses, the collision velocities must, in fact, be equal and opposite. So in this frame of reference, pre-collision momentum is zero. Post-collision momentum is zero. The, um, Recoil velocities are going to have magnitudes v, but pointing in um, uh, opposite directions. And our angles are going to be transformed in this um, new frame. Our angles are being transformed. This was theta. In the prime frame, it's theta prime. In the centre of momentum frame, it's theta prime. Phi, correspondingly, phi prime. But by trigonometry, this is now uh, a straight line. Fair enough. So this phi prime is going to be the same as pi minus theta prime because this angle plus this angle must add to pi radians. So we can already see that things are simpler in the centre of momentum frame. So the classic relativistic logic is stare at your problem, decide in which frame of reference um, your calculation is simplest, do your calculation in that particular frame of reference, and once you've got your answer, then transform the result back to uh, the laboratory frame. One other point, we've already learned about the relativity of direction, so it shouldn't surprise us that these uh, angles change as we go from frame to frame. So um, this is a scenario. Again, the key idea, do the problem in, in frame S prime, uh, and then transform back to the unprimed frame. Now, you've got the full calculation in your notes. It'll make use of several previous results, uh, including the relativity of direction uh, and also the transformation law for gamma factors. Um, by the way, neither transforms as a tensor, neither direction nor gamma factors is, is tensorial, but we've studied their transformation properties previously. Uh, uh, you'll need to use those results, uh, and you'll do the calculation in this frame uh, and transform back. And when you do so, you'll obtain the result which is given uh, in equation 139, that the tan of theta multiplied by the tan of phi uh, equals 2, divided by the gamma factor considered as a function of this uh, speed of the um, bullet particle relative to the lab frame plus 1. Now, when I was um, reading this result in uh, uh, the textbook by Rindler, which is excellent and I highly recommend it. Uh, he made the point that if we take the non-relativistic limit, the NRL, yep, the gamma factor will tend to 1, and you'll get the right-hand side tending to 2 on 2, which is 1. So in the non-relativistic limit, where um, this gamma factor tends to 1, tan theta tan phi tends to 1. Um, Windler then says, as every billiard player knows, uh, the consequence of tan theta tan phi tending to 1 is that theta plus phi is 1, tends to 1, uh, that this angle here between the recoiling bullet and the recoiling target is a right angle. And apparently every good billiard player knows this. I didn't know that. Uh, I'm a terrible billiards player and still am. But I learned from the non-relativistic limit of the relativistic billiards problem uh, that when you strike a stationary billiard ball, the two balls will fly off with an angle of uh, precisely 90 degrees between them. 
in the context of this um, calculation, what this is saying is that this um, opening angle uh, adding to 90 degrees, and I'm sorry, this shouldn't be one, uh, this is 90 degrees. You could write down the corresponding angle in radians. Um, the fact that this uh, opening angle, theta plus phi is called the opening angle, uh, is 90 degrees, is a signature that you're um, you have a non-relativist, you, you have a calculation that's well described, a collision, sorry, that is well described by the non-relativistic limit, a collision that is not relativistic. And so as an example of this, if you were to have proton-proton um, collision, so let the bullet be a proton, let the stationary target relative to the lab frame be a proton, and they're just going to bang off each other. Uh, and you can take photographs of this kind of thing, and for example, suppose that the bullet um, the incident proton had an energy of 5 mega electron volts. Uh, again, you can take uh, images of these things, and the image um, that's given in the notes is actually in a photographic emulsion. Uh, you can take photos of this, which I find absolutely remarkable. Yep, the high-energy particle travels through. Uh, it exposes a photographic emulsion. This will be the trace, the trajectory of the incident proton, the stationary proton is just some poor proton sitting there inside one of the atoms in the emulsion. After the collision we have uh, the two recoiling protons uh, and this angle being 90 degrees is actually a signature that this collision is not uh, relativistic. However, if we replace the incident proton energy, same process, proton-proton collision, same process but we now crank up the energy from mega electron volts to giga electron volts then, and we switch from photographic emulsion to what's called the bubble chamber. What, what's a bubble chamber? Imagine that you filled uh, this room with liquid hydrogen and that it was superheated, it was ready to boil, but there was no point at which the bubbles could begin to boil, so it's at above its boiling point but still a liquid. Good example, you place water in a clean cup put it in, so don't do this, now don't put it in a microwave, don't press three minutes um, on the microwave on high uh, and then don't look at the resulting cup of water that's just sitting there and not boiling. You then put some sugar in it and the whole thing starts to boil, it's superheated. It's above 100 degrees when you don't do this experiment, um, but, when you, but, but it doesn't have a pr preferred place to begin boiling. So when you don't put in the, um, the, the tea bag or the, or the sugar, then um, the liquid can't. Too many negatives. Um, our liquid has no place to nucleate, but when you give it a nucleation centre, it begins to boil. Replace that superheated water in the microwave with superheated liquid hydrogen. Um, replace the um, tea leaves or the, sh or the sugar crystals with um, a high energy particle such as an incident proton travelling through. It'll leave a wake of bubbles in its wake. You might even put um, an incident magnetic field on this thing so the, curve partic so the particles would trace some curve. One, set one direction depending on their charge, other direction depending on their charge. But these are very high energy, they're travelling in a straight line wake of bubbles, which you can then photograph. Um, and these, by the way, are amongst the most beautiful images in all physics, the so-called bubble chamber photographs, uh, where you see, literally, uh, subatomic particles doing their thing. Um, and many of these pictures are quite intricate. Anyway, uh, you can have a proton-proton collision. And the key point here is that this opening angle, theta plus phi, is actually less than 90 degrees. And this is a signature of, of um, and it's predicted via this formula, and this is a signature of a relativistic collision. So that's it for relativistic billiards. Um, I want to now move over to the centre of momentum frame. We've already seen the utility of working in a frame of reference, this one, in which the total set um, momentum of the particles vanishes. I want to generalise this in studying the so-called centre of momentum frame, which I'll do now in section 27. So section 27, uh, centre of momentum frame, which I'll abbreviate as COM. So instead of having two, two particles doing collisions, I want to have multiple particles undergoing collisions. So I might have some uh, series of world lines in space-time. And those world lines, I want them to be straight 
in space time. In other words, I want these to be free particles. Um, so here's just a free particle doing its thing, growing old and moving through space time, having some world line that is straight. At some instant of time, it might decide to, few, to, to split into a pair of particles, and after the, the splitting event, I then have them, after the splitting event A, it then have a pair of, of particles uh, travelling through space-time with the approximation of no forces between them. Uh, this is a, a splitting event. We could also have fusion events um, at the point B in space-time. Uh, this particle might choose to split into a pair of particles. Yep. And we could have uh, other such of events um, going on, whatever they might, what they might be. So we have a series of, of straight line um, paths in space-time. And we already have the hypothesis of the conservation of full momentum. And I might say at some time, just add up the full momenta uh, of each particle. Remember that the full momentum, which we derived in the last class, boldface P, it's a tensor. It can be written in two forms. The energy of the particle divided by C, and then its momentum, P. Uh, we had another form, if I write E equals mc squared, the left term becomes mc, m is the moving mass, p is the momentum, momentum. two different expressions for this tensorial object, the energy momentum tensor, capital P. And I say form momentum is conserved, right? Um, fair enough. Just add up the form momentum of every particle at each instant of time, and that's going to be constant. But uh, what do we mean by an instant of time? Well, according to some frame um, S prime, when I say T equals naught, this defines a plane in space-time. This is according to S. And that plane, let me give it a name, let me call it pi. I don't know, pi subscript S. And this is a plane of simultaneity, uh, a hypersurface in space-time for which T is constant, say naught. And the number of particles is one, two. There's two particles at that instant of time. And there's so many things in rel relativity that are relative. Um, energy is relative, momentum is relative, force is relative, acceleration is relative, length is relative, electric field is relative, magnetic field is relative. The number of people in this room is relative and the number of particles at any instant of time is also relative because if I was to Lorentz transform to a different frame of reference, uh, I would have some different plane of simultaneity according to S prime, which I might call pi subscript S prime. And notice that as I Lorentz transformed, the number of particles changed. In one frame of reference, this um, splitting event uh, occurred in the past, um, yet we go to a different frame of reference and that gets pushed. Uh, um, so it occurred in the future of this. This splitting event had not yet occurred. One particle had not yet become two. Yet we change our frame of reference uh, and the plane of simultaneity sweeps through this so-called vertex D, the point being that the number of particles is itself relative. So what do we mean when we say that energy, uh, the total form momentum is conserved? Well, what we mean is that if it has a certain value over one plane of constant time, it will then have, and this is a series of parallel hyperplanes, it will have the same value at every um, surface of constant time in any inertial frame, and we can fill the space. The term is foliate, as in leaves of a book. You can foliate the space with a series of parallel planes. Constant time according to one frame, constant time according to the other frame. But uh, relativity of the number of particles, the number of particles present at any one point um, in time is a relative concept, but momentum is conserved, the sum of the incoming form momenta, oh, sorry, the, the sum of all form momenta, and this is not a tensor index, this is just a, an index labelling the form momenta of each particle, this is going to be constant according to any frame of reference. Along each of these constant trajectories, there's no forces, the form momentum is going to be constant. At each of these so-called vertices, our form momentum will be conserved. The sum of the or the form momentum just before the vertex A is going to be the sum of the form momentum after. And as we Lorentz transform from one set of planes of simultaneity, 
which foliate the space, that fill the space, uh, to another plane. Each time we cross one of these vertices, full momentum is still conserved. In other words, um, this concept is not problematic, even though it might appear to be at first blush. So full momentum is conserved, good. Even if the number of particles is relative. I want to introduce the center of momentum frame. Now, it's going to be nothing more than the frame in which the total momentum, the total three momentum, the sum of these things, um, is um, zero. Total momentum vanishes. Yep. The sum of these will vanish. So just with a view to doing this, I'm going to introduce some quantities. M bar, this is not an average, this is a total mass. This is just the sum of the masses of all the particles. And you could put superscript J if you wanted to, sorry, a label J if you wanted to. Let me just be loose. Some of the masses of the particles uh, at any instant of time in any particular inertial frame, I'm calling M bar. P bar, so it's P vector bar, um, is going to be the sum of the momenta. Uh, capital P bar, this is bold, but I can't do bold with textures, so I'll just use a capital P. The total form momentum will be the sum of the individual form momenta. Again, you can put the labels on if you want, which is the sum of the MCPs. And M, I remind you, is moving mass, but if we put um, the sum of the moving masses is going to be M bar. So the first term sums to M bar C, and the second term sums to P bar. This might seem like some idle doodling, but we'll uh, be using it. So centre of momentum frame is going to be a particular inertial frame, S, subscript CM. CM stands for centre of momentum. Again, this is going to be the frame in which the total three momentum, this thing here, vanishes. What velocity does this thing, if you give me an arbitrary inertial frame, this thing will not vanish. Question, what, fr what boost velocity do I need um, in order to get a frame in which the total momentum vanishes? And the answer is, let the boost velocity needed, this is going to be in an arbitrary direction, so I'm calling it the little vector, little u, subscript cm. The boost velocity you'll need is going to be p bar divided by m bar. This is just momentum equals mass times velocity averaged, and then solve for the average velocity. So this is the velocity to with which you need to boost. And if you're in your frame S, which you choose to be your standard of rest, if um, your total momentum is m bar u, then just boost, not along the x-axis, but boost in this uh, arbitrary direction u c m given by this and in that new frame of reference this center of momentum frame right which is traveling in this direction uh, in that new frame the total momentum will be naught i just want to make a a, a brief comment about center of mass it probably comes as no surprise to you that center of mass is frame dependent. Let me prove it to you quickly. Um, suppose I have two objects, identical objects, same rest mass, and suppose that they are moving towards one another with, in a frame of reference, equal and opposite velocities. Now the mass of a moving object is heavier than the mass of a stationary object. These have the same rest mass. They are approaching each other with equal and opposite velocities, therefore they have the same moving mass, therefore by symmetry the centre of mass will be exactly at the midpoint between them. Fair enough. Let's now boost to a different frame of reference in which uh, the left particle is stationary. The left particle is stationary, um, then the right particle will be travelling um, towards that object with some velocity capital V that is bigger than V in magnitude. This object will be heavier than this one, and so the centre of mass will no longer be at the midpoint, but rather will be displaced towards the object that is moving, uh, again in a given frame. The point here is that the concept of centre of mass is frame dependent. Uh, the concept of centre of mass is relative. But um, 
remember the idea of proper quantities. The proper time is the time read on a wristwatch that is stationary, uh, that is instantaneously stationary. The proper length of, a, of, a, of an object is the length ascribed to it in a frame of reference in which that object is at rest. The proper centre of mass, since centre of mass is frame dependent, uh, we're going to define the centre of mass, the proper centre of mass to be the position of the centre of mass in the centre of momentum frame. Just to repeat, the proper centre of mass will be the centre of mass in the centre of momentum frame. Now, let's take this equation as a starting point. Total momentum is m, c, m, m bar c comma p bar. Now, I'm going to leave the first term alone. This is equation 143 in the notes. Um, P bar, sorry, this P bar uh, is the same thing as U centre of mass times M bar. So it's the centre of, of momentum. That's good. Now, just as a piece of trickery, I want to factor out the M bar. Well, that's not really a trick. But now I'm going to multiply by 1 on gamma times gamma. 1 on gamma. And this is considered as a function of the speed of the centre of mass, this scalar, is the magnitude of this vector. I'm multiplying by gamma to the minus 1 gamma. So I've multiplied by 1. For reasons it'll become clearer in a second. And what I'm left with is C comma UCM. You'll see where we're heading in a second. Now this object that I'm underlining is the four velocity of the centre of momentum, or the four, four velocity of the centre of mass. So this is a four velocity. Um, or it's actually the four velocity of the frame S prime, in which uh, the total momentum is naught. So I'm going to give it a name, the four velocity um, subscript CM. And this object out the front I'm leaving alone, M bar, gamma to the minus one, as a function of UCM. It's at this point that I want to invoke the quotient rule of tensor analysis. Yep. Roughly speaking, the quotient of two tensors is a, is a tensor. Now, this object here is a tensor. It's a sum of four momenta, which is a tensor. This object here is a tensor. It's a four velocity. Hence, by the quotient rule, this object here is a tensor. Yep. So by the quotient rule, the double underlined quantity is um, a tensor. And I'm going to give this uh, tensor a name, um, which is M bar CM, which, by the way, is just the total mass in the center of momentum frame. M bar CM equals all this stuff. And I could take this expression and multiply through by gamma to get uh, M bar which is the total mass in any frame, um, equaling gamma times the total mass in the centre of momentum frame. So, so this is equation 144 in the notes. And with this, I can take my expression for P bar, the total for momentum, uh, this thing, and just write it as this object here, M bar gamma to the minus one, which is M bar CM, uh, times the four velocity that was previously mentioned. So this is the final in, uh, equation of this section. It just says something very simple, uh, which is the total for momentum. The total for momentum. Um, is the total mass in the centre of momentum frame times the four velocity of the centre of momentum frame. And I want to move on to section 28 regarding threshold energies. So the context here is that you want to create particles. You want to discover um, new particles with your Large Hadron Collider, with your um, state-of-the-art uh, particle collider. And you want to ask the question, what is the minimum energy that I need to create some new particle? What is the minimum energy I need to create some um, new particle? 
So you might have some collision problem where you have some bullet particle striking some target particle. For the sake of argument, let this be a proton and a proton. And you ask the question, well, I want something to happen and there'll be some complicated interaction, the nature of which I don't care about, because after the interaction, I'm going to have a recoiling proton, another recoiling proton. So these are all protons. This is P for proton, not for momentum. But I want to create some new particle, for example, a pi naught meson, or a Higgs particle, whatever. Um, and I want to ask the question, what is the minimum energy that I require of this in order to create a new particle of a given rest mass. Uh, it's a little bit like um, hitting a ping pong ball in space with a hammer and turning that ping pong ball into multiple ping pong balls. And I mentioned this uh, analogy, apart from the fact that it's kind of cool, to make the following point. Um, momentum's conserved. You've got this bullet um, striking a stationary target. So the pre-collision momentum is zero. We're talking about three momentum here. Pre-collision momentum is zero, and the higher the energy of the bullet, the higher the pre-collision momentum. It's not enough to just say, well, make the energy of this thing, um, make the energy of the bullet simply the rest energy of a proton, I don't know, rest mass of a proton, mp, c squared, plus, you know, you want to make a pion, then just add the mass, the rest mass of the pion, c squared. This is wrong, because... Um, the pre-collision momentum is non-zero, hence the post-collision momentum is non-zero, hence a certain fraction of the energy of the incident bullet particle, or the bullet particle, must be wasted as moment wasted in inverted commas as momentum of the post-collision products. So the question of how much energy do I need to make a particle of a given rest mass uh, is not simply take the rest mass of the proton, give it enough extra energy, take the rest energy to the proton and add it to the rest energy of the in this case, the new particle. Not that simple. What we want to do here is to study precisely this problem. Yep. And the minimum energy that's required is going to be called the threshold energy. So let's be a little bit more general um, before we turn to the actual problem. Yep. I want to have... Uh, a bullet and a, a target and a bullet, and I want their pre-collision form momenta to be P1 and P2 respectively before the collision. After the collision, um, uh, this is going to become uh, the respective form momenta of the um, uh, post-collision products. But P1 and P2 are the form momenta of the uh, incident bullet and target particles respectively. Now, borrowing the notation from over here, um, and sorry, I've made one error on the right-hand side. Uh, this capital P should be barred, yep. Capital P bar is the sum of the momenta. So, what I'm calling capital P bar is the sum of the full momenta. So here we go. Let's take this expression and square it, right? So you're going to get p bar squared equals p1 squared plus etc. Now these are four-dimensional dot products, remember. Now I want to look at each of these terms separately. We learned in the previous lecture that p1 squared the dot product of the full momentum of a given material particle has an absolute significance. It's the rest mass of that particle, which I'll here call m naught one times c squared. Similarly, p2 squared has an absolute significance. As we learned last class, it's the rest mass of the particle 2, which I call m naught two times c squared. The dot product of the full momentum of two different particles has an absolute significance, and we calculated this object in the last class. It's um, a constant, which is 2c squared, times the product of the rest masses of the individual particles, here called m naught one and m naught two, uh, times the gamma factor, and that gamma factor is as a function of the relative speed v of the particles. This is why we calculated uh, p squareds and p1 dot p2s in the last class. How about p bar squared? Well, p bar squared um, 
has an absolute significance. It's the square of this object, but it's going to be the same in every reference frame. Yep. Um, so let's go to the centre of momentum frame. In the centre of momentum frame, m bar will become m bar cm, and p bar will become naught. Yep. So this p bar in the centre of momentum frame. Certainly that changes the tensor to the value that this tensor takes in the centre of momentum frame. But in that frame, m bar will become the value that m bar takes in the centre of momentum frame. But by definition, p bar is naught. That changes the tensor, but remember that this object squared is the same in every frame. So calculate in any frame you want. Calculate in the centre of momentum frame. When we square this, we'll get this squared minus naught dotted with itself. In other words, we'll get m bar c m c all squared. m bar c m c all squared. Now this equation invites the cancellation of the c squareds, which I do now. To get the following. So we're, we're staring at this, and just to give um, myself some time to think, uh, I'm just going to, sorry, sorry, let me take this left-hand side and write it on the right-hand side. Same equation. Now I'm staring at this. I'm not boxing it because it's important. It's not important yet, but it will be in a second. Yep. And I'm sorry, th these should have been squared. I'm staring at this equation, waiting for some bolt of insight to come. Yep. This is the rest mass of the target and bullet particles. This is going to be a threshold. Uh, this is the speed of the bullet relative to the target. Yep. In this scenario, it will be um, the magnitude of this velocity v. This is the total mass in the centre of momentum frame. And the total mass in the centre of momentum frame, energy is conserved, um, form momentum is conserved, uh, total mass is conserved. We learned that in the last class. Mass in the sense of moving mass. So this total mass in the centre of momentum frame had better be the same both before and after the collision. Now we've just focused on before the collision. Now I want to ask the question, what is the threshold of E? So I'm just writing this equation out again. This is a constant, I can't screw with it. It's the rest mass of the, of, the, of the bullet. This is a constant, I can't screw with that either. That's the rest mass of the target. We're getting towards our threshold velocities. This is a gamma factor as a function of V. And I want V to be as small as possible, the minimum V, to make my particles. I'm going to call this the threshold speed. This is my unknown. And the question is, what will be, you know, what's in the brackets, is going to be the total mass in the centre of momentum frame. So we go to a centre of momentum frame and I want three particles. And again, um, I want to be a bit generic, so I'm going to call the mass of the proton, um, the bullets, I'm going to call them capital M. These are rest masses. Yep. Put a naught subscript on them if you want. In fact, let me do so. No, I won't. These are rest masses. And I want to make a new particle with rest mass little m. I'm sitting in the centre of momentum frame and I ask the question, what is the minimum mass in the centre of momentum frame? Well, mass is minimised when something is stationary. If every single one of these has a zero velocity in the centre of momentum frame, this corresponds admittedly to an artificial scenario in which all the products are travelling together as one lump. But if they travel all together as one lump, then in the centre of momentum frame, every single one of these will be stationary. And the total mass in the centre of momentum frame will just be the mass of the two protons, big M plus big M, plus the rest mass, um, the rest masses of the protons, plus the rest mass of the particle I want to create. And so this would correspond to the minimum mass I could possibly have in the centre of momentum frame. Great. Um, the masses of the protons are known. Um, I'm now calling the mass of the bullet and targets big M. Um, 
this product of the m's is big m squared. I can just go ahead and solve this for gamma. I can get the gamma factor just by um, uh, s simple algebra. And once I've got the gamma factor, I can then solve for what I really want, which is the threshold speed, or, and that threshold speed, um, again, it's not as simple as one might expect, is c uh, times the square root of 1 minus, and then we have a big fraction, the numerator of which is 1, and the denominator of which is something squared. I see a 1 here, this must be dimensionally, um, all dimensionless, 2m, little m on big m, little m squared on 2 big m squared. And we can just stare at that formula and say, all right, that's the answer, this is the threshold speed. But I invite you to uh, throw some representative numbers into this to get a feel for um, what the required threshold speed is. What you'll find is that the bigger the rest mass of the particle you're trying to create, the more inefficient this process becomes. Um, in fact, it becomes um, extremely inefficient when you're trying to create new particles with big rest mass. The solution, by the way, is um, in particle accelerators, uh, if you want to accelerate, let's say, a, an electron or a proton around a, a ring, the proton, let's say, is accelerated uh, anti-clockwise. An anti-proton could be accelerated the other way. So what you do is you have um, your positively charged particles travelling one way, uh, your corresponding negatively charged particles travelling the other way. Um, you make them cross at a certain point. They have pretty much equal and opposite velocities. The total momentum in the lab frame is zero, and so you actually waste um, a minimal amount of momentum in the products. And this technique is called clashing beams. Um, so the technique of clashing beams, much more efficient way of creating new particles than a stationary bullet in the lab frame. So that's all I wanted to say about threshold uh, energies. I now want to move on to relativistic particle mechanics, um, of part two, uh, and in particular photons. One of the things we'll ask in this section is what is the full momentum of a photon? Yep. What is the full momentum of a photon? We also want to calculate um, the so-called Compton effect um, using four vectors. So what is the full momentum of a photon? Well, the form of the full momentum, capital P, I want to use is E on C comma P. We know that for a photon, um, E equals PC, um, E on C equals P. This tells us that the momentum for a photon is going to have a magnitude that's E on C in some frame of reference times some unit vector, which I call N hat. So, for a photon, P can be written as E on C times some unit vector, N hat, which is going to be um, a unit vector in the direction which the photon travels. Remember, I want an expression for the full momentum P of a photon. E on C can come out the front, and we get 1 comma N hat. So this is the full momentum of a photon. By the way, if I was to square the full momentum of a photon, I'd get E squared on C squared into 1 minus, remember that all-important minus, this started with itself, but it's a unit vector, so you get 1. In other words, the f square of the full momentum of a photon is naught. Lest that disturb you, remember that we live in a pseudo-Euclidean space here. Just because the vector's non-zero doesn't mean that it's square is non-zero. Uh, in fact, it is zero for a photon. Now, as a preface to considering Compton effect, let's consider a space in which there's two photons uh, living, and I'll want uh, P1 and P2. And that P1 and P2, um, these two photons will have their respective full momenta uh, as follows. Yep. Yep, so the first photon in fact, let me write E as H nu, nu being the frequency of the photon in a given frame. Frequency is relative, as we know from the Doppler effect. So the full momentum of the first photon will be H nu 1, nu of the first photon, 
1 comma n hat 1, n hat being the unit vector in which the first photon travels with n2 hat similarly defined, u2, etc. And we ask, what is this object? It has an absolute significance. It's a rank 0 tensor. It's a Lorentz invariant. I just dot product these two things together. What am I going to get? H, bar, H squared, nu1, nu2, divided by c squared, 1 times 1, which is 1, minus n1 hat dot n2 hat. If I call theta the angle between the photons in a given frame, then n1 hat dotted with n2 hat will be the magnitude of n1 hat, which is 1, times the magnitude of n2 hat, which is 1, times the cosine of the angle between them. So this um, is the dot product between the four momenta for two uh, photons. Suppose now that I had a photon with four momentum p and a material particle with four momentum q, the photon has four momentum, uh, as we've already argued, h nu on c into one comma n hat. The particle, as we've already learned, has a four momentum, which is its mass, its moving mass times c, times its momentum, all in some frame. We could ask the question, what happens when you dot product these two? Well, you'll get h nu on c, all in some fr frame. But let's make our life simple. This is an absolute has the same value in every frame. Let's choose a frame in which uh, our object is at rest. So we choose a frame in which the material particle is at rest. The moving mass becomes a rest mass m naught, and the momentum p becomes naught. And so in this frame, and by the way, the frequency will change. I should probably call it new tilde or something, but this is now going to be the, the frequency of the photon in the frame of reference in which the particle is at rest dot product h nu on c times m naught c. The c's are going to cancel and we have this as the um, dot product of the photon four vector momentum with the particles four momentum. Now the reason we're doing this is because we want to study Compton scattering. The Compton scattering can happily be studied without relativity, but let's study it with relativity. Um, we're going to have some photon with four momentum p, striking some stationary electron, and this is an X-ray photon in Compton scattering, striking a stationary electron with four momentum q. Uh, after the collision, we'll have a recalling photon with four momentum p prime, and a recalling electron with four momentum uh, q prime. By conservation of four momentum, we have the following. Now I could go ahead and square this, but I'm going to do a trick which will save 80% of the algebra. I'm going to shove the p prime to the left-hand side, and then I'm going to square it. Yep. I'm going to dot this object with itself. Yep. And when I dot this object with itself, uh, the right-hand side will be q prime squared. The left-hand side, uh, I could write out all the various terms. I'll leave it to you to, to write all those out. Um, the point is, we can then use the fact that p squared equals naught. We can also use the fact that yeah, p, p prime squared is naught. Those terms will all appear, you can get rid of them. Um, q squared doesn't equal naught, but it equals q prime squared. And so when you um, uh, make use of these f facts, you'll get that the dot product of the pre and post four momentum of the pre and post collision photons is the dot product of the pre-collision electron four momentum times the difference of the four momentum of photon pre and post collision. Next, we make use of the results that we've derived. In fact, the whole reason we derived this result here was because dot product of two photon four vectors momentum vectors, dot product of two photon four momentum vectors, dot product of a photon four momentum and a particle four momentum, which appears here and here. So we, we make use of these two boxed equations, and what you'll get will be the Compton scattering formula. 
um, and I've written it in the form of lambda prime minus lambda. Lambda prime is going to be the wavelength of the photon um, in the frame of reference in which the initial electron is at rest. Lambda prime is the wavelength after scattering. Lambda is the wavelength before. The difference of these wavelengths is 2h on c m naught sine squared of theta on 2. And this is the famous Compton scattering formula. Uh, the, fa the famous Compton scattering formula. That's it. Thank you.